everyone. I'm Savannah Sellers, your host for today, and welcome to the world's largest lesson live, a show focusing on the world of tomorrow. We all know that the world is facing enormous challenges right now. The COVID-19 pandemic has thrown so many lives up in the air, and many have had to figure out how to manage that, all while experiencing overwhelming inequality and injustice. That's why we're asking you to help reimagine our societies so they can be more fair, just, and inclusive for everyone, no matter who they are or where they live. We need that more than ever right now, right? We're going to hear from Amina Mohammed, the Deputy Secretary General of the UN, Henrietta Four, Executive Director of UNICEF, UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador Millie Bobby Brown, and UNICEF supporter Sophia Carson. Everyone will help to reimagine the future. Before that though, let's just be honest about the past few months. We know there have been moments that might have made us anxious, some moments of boredom, but also some moments of creativity and connectedness. Take a look. those clips, many of you have been learning differently over the past few months. COVID-19 has meant we've had to make huge changes. Over two-thirds of students around the world, that's more than a billion of you, have been out of school. It's been a challenge, but also a chance to think about education. What is education for, and how can we reimagine it so that every child can reach their full potential? Making sure everyone gets a quality education is one of the sustainable development goals. These are also known as the Global Goals or the SDGs for short. There are 17 of them agreed on by world leaders back in 2015. They're like a to-do list for the planet and this is where you come in. We need your ideas and solutions to help achieve them. This is why I asked Amina Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations and Sophia Carson, a UNICEF supporter and champion for education to join me in a conversation about how we can achieve SDG4, quality education for all. Hello, Deputy Secretary General Amina J. Mohammed, and hello, Sophia Carson. Thank you guys both for joining us today on the world's largest lesson live. I'm so excited to be able to speak with you both about education and its importance and how we're all sort of having to cope in different ways, even with how we're learning during this unique time. And I think that's something that we're all dealing with is missing people and being around people. Now, Sophia, if I can ask you to think back to your time as a teenager, what do you think would have been on your mind right now? You know, I think about when I was a teenager and when school was, you know, my whole world, it was my favorite place to be. And um, I can imagine that I would feel confused and I would feel worried and I would feel, I'm sure, frustrated, um, mainly scared. And I know that a lot of kids and teenagers are feeling exactly those things. And I can imagine those feelings being so heightened as the world and the different experiences that you have had. Why is it that an education is? Well, um, I mean, when you start to reflect a, about ability to communicate, I mean, it's mm -hmm. so simple. But when I go back uh, to the schools that I went to, that I went to so many years ago, today, the numbers coming out of those classrooms that cannot read or write um, in in English or in the the local language, um, they are huge. So they're not able to communicate, and I think we take for granted how important communicating is. But communicating and engaging, engaging with issues that you learn about um, in your society, in your community, that teach you respect and tolerance, um, and uh, that there is strength and diversity and that everyone is equal. Um, I think those are things that we took for granted, but were a very big part of our education. The investment in education, um, it allows you to go to the stars and back. 
to imagine your future to, to you needed an education and an education um, is, is freedom. It allows you to go places that you could not otherwise go. Oh, I love what you just said. It can allow you to go to the stars and back. Sophia, what do you think from, from your experiences of traveling and, and seeing different children of different cultures and, and what it is that you think an education means in those young lives? An education is not only something that changes lives, but as I've seen with my work with UNICEF, something that saves lives as well. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that schools have become so much more than just, uh, you know, four walls that hold books. They are a refuge, they're a home, they're a shelter. Uh, they are the place where lives are saved. I'll never forget when I traveled to Brazil with UNICEF last summer and I had the privilege of holding in my arms young women who opened their hearts to us and shared with us their stories. Their stories about how quite literally before they walk through the halls of their school, their lives are at risk. We are going to have one other person join us. It's my great pleasure to invite Adrian Harabos from Prague to join the call. Um, I believe he has an important question for you both. Hi everyone. I'm really excited to be here. It's a, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, so my question, well, it can sometimes feel in school uh, that education is just about passing a test or receiving a good grade. Uh, so what aspects to education do you think are really important? For me as a performer and as a singer and an actor, so maybe in school you can find passions and creative outlets that otherwise you wouldn't have discovered and you could light fires and you like, if you take an art class and you find an outlet through art or when I took music class and that was my escape. Thank you for, for asking such a wise um, and thoughtful and thoughtful question. Thank you for answering. My pleasure. Thank you, thank you, Adrian. And I think it's really important to remember um, the courage of your convictions. You know, you learn in school. Uh, what matters to you um, and you know you have to take that courage with you because the courage of the convictions give you your integrity they give you a sense of dignity that you can move with and you really never know where you will be in life I never had any imagination that my career track would take me to the number two person in the United Nations absolutely and I love specifically Adrian the way that you asked that question because I do think that day to day a lot of times it can't feel like it's just taking this test or getting this grade and I'm grateful to both of these women for expanding that out and, and helping us look at it and actually Adrian I um, would love if you could stick around I want to hear from you also in my final question if I could hear from all three of you right now we know that school feels different. We know that education feels different. There are certainly things that we're missing about being in our classrooms and with our friends and seeing our teachers every day. But are there any elements that have come from doing school differently right now because of this crisis that we can take forward? Can it help us reimagine the future of education at all? I'm in this uh, school of lifelong learning. And so I will say that one of the things that um, has happened to me um, is that uh, this pause button that COVID has caused for all of us is one of deep reflection. Um, and I see an opportunity to build back better and to reimagine education where this is the opportunity for that intergenerational shift for mm -hmm. my generation to the next generation that gets a chance to shape that education. This is a time for rebirthing. It's a time for thinking about our humanity, about our tolerance. I mean, we hear all the dark side of the world today, but there's so much brighter because of this huge cohort of youth, the tools that we have, um, and the opportunity for leadership. Where there's a vacuum, young people fill it. Don't dwell on where there's no leadership, just fill it with good leadership. And, and education will get you a long way um, in making sure we get the right leadership. Absolutely, and I hope that even that right there gives our audience some hope to hear that they can absolutely be part of the solution. Sophia, what about you? Anything that you'd like to see that sort of continue moving forward? Despite the unprecedented circumstances that we have been in, we've also seen both students and teachers go above and beyond to ensure that education continues. And I hope that there's so much from what we've experienced that we carry with us and we take with us after today. Absolutely. And Adrian, as someone who's going through this right now, is there anything that that you can sort of see that you want to take with you from this time to help reimagine what this can look like going forward? I feel that there are uh, some key elements in online learning, but uh, as DSG and uh, Sophia said, 
uh, actually going to school and the social interactions you have there is uh, definitely irreplaceable. Mm. Um, but as they, all, uh, as they said, uh, school isn't only about getting good grades and learning, uh, learning how to, uh, it's about learning how to work with people, learning how to be organized and how to be kind to others. And um, when I reimagined the future of education, I'd like to see have, uh, everyone having equal access to online learning and technology. Absolutely, and I think that this particular crisis that we're in has highlighted some of that, some of the differences that exist. I think it's helped a little bit with getting more people set up, but it's something that we know we have to focus on going forward. And this certainly made that of even more importance that we've all been able to see. You guys, what a great conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks for fielding all the questions. Adrian, thank you for joining us and for your great question. DSG and Sophia, I'm so grateful for your time. Thank you so much. COVID-19 has meant many of us are paying more attention to our physical health maybe than ever before. But what about our mental health? We know that change and uncertainty can cause anxiety and feelings of stress. This is why I am so grateful that Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove from the World Health Organization was able to join me in a conversation to discuss how we can look after ourselves and each other. So grateful for your time right now. I feel lucky to be able to speak with someone who really knows what's going on. I think right now information feels like power and thank you for joining all of us for the world's largest lesson live. Um, again, we so appreciate your time. Um, I want to start by asking you a question that I think a lot of us are kind of thinking about right now and that is what can we do to support young people's mental health during this time? And how do you think that they can cope with the uncertainty that we're real all, really all dealing with for who knows how long? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. And, and I, I really appreciate the invitation. Um, you point out mental health it is, it is so critical that we focus not only on our physical health, but our mental health as well. These are uncertain times. And, and it is so important that we are well informed. Information is power and information is changing. So keep up to date on the latest information. That's really important. And find that information from good sources. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation out there and that can be confusing and sometimes scary. So get your information from good sources. Talk to your parents, talk to a trusted adult, you know, and, and, and talk regularly. The other thing is, um, you know, no, be okay with your feelings. Um, it's okay to be nervous. It's okay to be scared. It's okay to, to, to just, just not to have some sad days, um, but talk through that. You know, these, it's important to, to feel it, to, to, to own it, um, but find ways to be positive. There's many things, even though this pandemic is uncertain, there's, this pandemic is not stopping on our ability to laugh, is not stopping our ability to love and play games and read a book, um, to, to do the things that, that make us happy. So every day find something that will make you happy. I love that. And it is even helping me to hear you say, it's okay to be sad. It's okay to have those days and recognize those feelings and knowing that a lot of us are feeling that way. You're not alone in that. I think is really important. And We're all feeling that no matter what, no matter what age, no matter where we are, we're all feeling that. Mm, exactly. Thank you for that reminder. Um, it is now my immense pleasure to bring in someone absolutely fantastic all the way from India. We now have Shashank joining us. I think he's got a great question for you. So my question is, what have been the young people been doing to stop this pandemic? Is there anything else for them to do to stop this pandemic? Thank you so much for this really critical question. Children are fundamental to tackling this pandemic. They are sources of information with each other. Um, they are protecting themselves from getting infected by washing their hands uh, and you, or using an alcohol-based rub, practicing respiratory etiquette. Those things are very critical. And making sure that not only you protecting yourself from getting infected, you're actually helping to prevent the onward spread to an adult and to someone who is even more vulnerable who may develop severe disease. The other thing that children are doing, which I am so inspired by every day, is you are being kind to one another. 
I have seen tremendous acts of kindness from children, from drawing pictures, from helping out their parents, for helping a loved one or a neighbor that needs some extra help. You are showing us the way. You are showing us the best of humanity. And we are so grateful that so many wonderful children all over the world are playing a critical role in fighting this pandemic. What a fantastic answer and thing to focus on that we all have a role to play. We can all do something. And now my final question is actually to both of you. So please stick with us. And doctor, I'll start with you. How do you think you would reimagine the future of health? How can we move forward from this moment? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Uh, many people now are talking about how do we build back better? How do we come out of this in a better place than, they, when we, than we were before. Um, and it's not only build back better, it's build back greener. You know, how do we protect our planet and use this opportunity to protect our planet? Mm -hmm. The ways in which we're thinking about building back better has to do with our public health infrastructure. You know, what does public health look like every day? What does access to healthcare look like every day? And that must be improved. We must put in the investments into building back health as a priority. Health is not something you need to think of as a financial burden. It's an investment. The more money that we put into health, building these systems from the ground up, making sure that people have access to quality health care will help prevent any future outbreaks that, that come our way and will have benefits for all other types of diseases. Amazing. Thank you so much for that information. And now, Shashank, I'd love to hear what you think. Future health would be totally focused towards the patients. Future healthcare centers would be probably focusing on the prevention of the diseases rather than the treatment because prevention is always better than cure. Future healthcare system will be organized and regulated in a unique way through your mobile apps like self-assessing yourself. Even there will be various digital solutions, prevention of various diseases. Totally, the future health would be perfectly dependent upon the digital system like artificial intelligence, robotics, and internet. Thank you. Doctor, I think you need Shashank at the World Health Organization. Just going to say, Shashank, if you are looking for a job in the future, an internship, you better reach out to me because that was a fantastic, very thoughtful answer. Well done. So many great ideas that we really are hearing our top organizations like the World Health Organization thinking about talking through and, and your head is so in the right space. Thank you both for those answers. Thank you for this conversation, you guys. And I think it just to get, as we said at the beginning, real information, knowledge from a source straight from the World Health Organization we're hearing this is, is really helpful to sort of make us all feel a little bit better about the direction we're moving in. So thank you guys both so much for joining me today. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Maria and Shashank. A great reminder that we all have to take care of ourselves and each other. So we've been talking about the future for education and health and what that might look like. Now it's time to talk about how we can achieve those global goals. I've asked UNICEF's Executive Director Henrietta Foer and youngest Goodwill Ambassador Millie Bobby Brown to join me in a conversation about activism and how they would reimagine the future for young people everywhere. Hello, Millie, and hello, ED4. Thank you guys so much for having this conversation with me today about activism and the future. Now, Millie, a question for you. I love talking about the role that young people can take, like many of the people who are watching right now, when we are dealing with these big global issues. And Millie, I know you, working with UNICEF to support children everywhere, have lots of experience with this. What type of role do you think that young people can play right now? Young people have been positive agents of change in the fight uh, against COVID in so many ways, leading their communities to support and protect vulnerable people using school technologies to produce protective equipment and making uh, and making sure their friends and family have accurate information on the virus. Um, it all shows what difference we can make. 
the problem um, has never been that young people's voices weren't loud enough. <laughs> I, I think I learned that. It's that they need to be listened to and taken seriously when decisions are made that affect them and their futures. So one thing uh, that needs to be considered is how young people who don't have access to the internet can take part in these conversations. And as a UNICEF Global Ambassador, I am a champion for children's rights. And that means every child. Leaders need to look at ways to make sure children and young people everywhere are heard, including the most vulnerable. So some of the most incredible solutions, I think, will come from them. That is such an important point. And I think with this generation in particular, it's about talking with them and to them and not about them, not just things that are going to potentially affect their future without involving them in that discussion. That's, that is such a great point. Thank you, Millie. Now, 84, what can we all do to help create that world where they are involved in these conversations? And then is there a role that the global goals can sort of play as markers for us with this activism in the future? Yes, yeah, so, so let me pick up on something that Millie just said, which is finding solutions. That's a real hallmark for what this century's activism is going to be like. It's going to be creating and designing solutions. So it's just underlined, great point, Millie. I'm so glad you made it. Your voice mm -hmm. makes a huge difference. So um, the global goals are a blueprint for action. They're powerful. They carry power within them. But we want everyone's handprints all over them you'll find somewhere in those global goals, something that really connects for you. These goals are for everyone. They're about everyone. They're to include everyone. I'm loving the girl power on this panel right now. And that's enough questions from me and we will keep the girl power going here because we are going to bring in someone else right now. This is Yale Krupnikov. She is a 17 year old from Argentina and she's got a very important question for you. I know she's gonna knock it out of the park. She's coming on in now. Hi, uh, very happy to be here with you all. My question is, when it comes to activism, there can sometimes be a lot of conflict between people from different generations because each may feel like the other doesn't understand. Adults sometimes think that young people don't care or don't know enough about current affairs. And meanwhile, teenagers often feel misunderstood or ignored by the adults around them. So. How can young people lead collective action in their own way so that they are heard and so that their voices have a true impact? That is a great question, Edie. Do you want to take it first? I'd love to. Okay, I, I love that question. Um, being one of the older people, I, I want you to know that there's much more interest among older people to connect with younger people and to do something with you. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, my suggestion would be choose one of the goals, one that really connects with you. So let's say it's um, oceans and choose something about it that you say to yourself, I want to find a solution for this and then begin studying, uh, know everything there is to know about it, listen to what other people are saying, develop that wonderful term empathy so that you can hear what's on another person's mind and what their heart feels, uh, but find out what they're thinking about it because there could be many ways to come up with solutions and then come up with some solutions to do together. And ask an older person to do something with you. You know, they were young too. They'll get it. They'll want to say yes to you. <laughs> and Millie, what do you think? Um, yeah, I just want to add, I think that we've, again, we've seen a lot of solidarity between generations recently. I think young people have shown that they understand that the crisis can affect older people and maybe even some of their relatives. So they have to adapt their behavior to help protect the most vulnerable. And hopefully this solidarity is something, you know, we can take forward into the future. I know that I love working with my, my grandmother um, on things, even though, you know, now she doesn't sometimes know the exact current affairs that are going on. I know that I love working with her in, in finding uh, solutions and making a difference. 
And Yael, again, great question. Thank you so much for bringing that to the conversation. And now I've got a final question for all three of you that we'd love to hear from. How would you reimagine what the world could look like tomorrow? And I know that's big and open-ended, but you know, what are some of the things that you really hope for? ED4, I'll start with you. I'd love to see a world that didn't see age as being a barrier in any way. That would be one. Um, the second one is, I would love to see a world that comes out of COVID stronger than when it entered it. We can build a world back better. And we can build a world that has Yale's social cohesion where we're talking among generations, that has Millie's activism, that is finding solutions. So if we want that, then let's encourage governments to invest in things like connectivity so that this next generation will have the chance to create all of those better solutions among themselves. I like the sound of your world of tomorrow, 84. Wow, I'm gonna go with that, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> Melly, what about you? What do you think? In my role uh, at UNICEF, I talk a lot about kindness. This is something that is very important to me personally. We've uh, seen an overwhelming amount of kindness over the last few months. So it would be incredible if we kept this going. We need to support each other, especially on social media. We have to make sure it isn't a place of bullying and harassment. It can actually bring people together and be a place of love and support and inspire social change. I love that too, you guys. We're building a beautiful tomorrow right now. Now to end our conversation, Yale, we'd also love to hear from you on what you'd reimagine the world to look like tomorrow. Thank you. I, uh, I think what Millie has been saying about social media is really key. It's, it's really one of the best tools that we have to make our voices heard and spread important messages. So I'd love to see a world where more young people use it to get involved with causes they believe in and propose new policies or ideas. I'd love to reimagine a world where politics and activism are open to young people, where they are allowed to take part in the discussions that matter and where their voices are heard. You know, more diversity at the decision-making table will mean that the decisions we arrive at will also become more diverse. And so new perspectives and new solutions will appear as well as role models that show other teenagers that we can make a difference. And so that makes me really hopeful for the future. I like how, Yale, yeah, when you were talking in each of our little boxes, we were all nodding like this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's amazing. I love listening to you, Yale. Winnie loved your speech. She said, good job, Yale. You did a great job over in Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so much, Winnie. Welcome, and thank you for joining at the end here. And ED4, Millie, Yale, thank you guys so much for a wonderful conversation and for the work that you're doing and the empathy that you exhibit just all the time. It's, it's clear in the words that you guys have all chosen and spoken today. So thank you so much. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good. Bye. Thanks, Savannah. Bye, Millie. Bye, Yale. Bye. 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 Wasn't that an incredible conversation? What they're saying is working together can be so powerful, and it's what we're doing right now in helping to stop COVID-19. That's why I'm really glad to introduce a message from Dr. Tedros. Hi, everyone. I'm Tedros, and I'm the Director General of the World Health Organization. And I want to say thank you to young people all over the world for everything you have been doing over the past few months to reduce the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. I know many of you have had to make big changes to your lives. It has been a difficult time for all of us, and sometimes a scary one. But I want you to know this. The changes you have made have helped to keep other people safe. COVID-19 has kept us physically apart, but it has also brought people closer together to support each other in our common fight against a common enemy. At the World Health Organization, we're doing everything we can to support countries to overcome this pandemic. We only succeed when we all work together. Everything you do to keep yourself safe from COVID-19 helps all of us. 
we're all in this together. Just as we have united to fight this pandemic, it's only through helping each other and working together that we can achieve the sustainable development goals for a healthier, safer future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. It's great to know we've all made such a difference. We've heard from so many people today. Everybody's voice is so important when we look to reimagine the world. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce some incredible voices from the Brooklyn Youth Chorus to finish the show. Like you, they've been physically distancing, but it hasn't stopped them from coming together to sing with one voice. Have you ever felt like nobody but there? Have you ever felt forgotten in the middle of nowhere? Have you ever felt like you could disappear? Like you could fall and no one would hear? So let that lonely feeling wash away Cause maybe there's a reason to believe you'll be okay And when you don't feel strong enough to stand You can reach, reach out your hand And all stand up for what you believe in. And you will never be alone. performance. Thank you for watching. I'm Savannah Sellers, and this has been the world's largest lesson live created in partnership with UNICEF. We hope that you have enjoyed the show and that when you go away, you remember that wherever and whoever you are, you are not alone. When we work together, we all have the power to create the world we want to see, one in which everyone has their rights and are treated equally with respect and with dignity. Be safe, be well, and thank you.